My paper this morning then takes as its point of departure the title of our conference. Now let's just remind ourselves of what that title is because it hasn't actually been mentioned so far, at least that I've heard. And I realized I'm as much at fault for that as anyone having welcomed everyone to the event yesterday. Uh, so far, we've been referring to the event as the Petra E Conference, but it does have a separate title, Literary Translation Studies Today and Tomorrow. Uh, in this paper, then, I want to focus on the key term literary translation studies, under which banner James has gathered us together. I want to focus on it and problematize it. Specifically, and to get straight to the perhaps polemical heart of my paper, I've given my talk the title Towards a Literary Translation Studies because whatever literary translation studies might be, it doesn't seem to me as though we've actually got there yet. Our conference is devoted to literary translation studies, but this is a discipline that appears not yet to exist, nor is that even a particularly controversial statement for various kinds of evidence bear it out. Let me explain. Um, astonishing as it may seem, um, there's not yet been a book published, in English at least, with the phrase literary translation studies in its title. Uh, that's at least um, according to my best searches. Uh, the closest I've found is in fact the monograph series that I co-edit with Jacob Blakesley at Routledge, Routledge Studies in Literary Translation. And it's funny to reflect on that now because I can say with some confidence that when we were planning the series, uh, although we certainly intended it to be innovative in lots of ways, the series title wasn't one of them. The phrase literary translation studies does feature in the title of some degree programs, but even then we're talking only three programs worldwide, the MAs in literary translation studies at the University of Warwick in the UK, University of Rochester in the USA, and Wellington University in New Zealand, to which one can add a module in literary translation studies that features on the comparative literature program at Glasgow University. If there are other examples, do please let me know. If you Google literary translation studies as a phrase, then the first page of 10 results comprises one reference to the Rochester MA, uh, two to the MPhil program here at Trinity, uh, which although it's technically the MPhil in literary translation is described in places online as the MPhil in literary translation studies. Uh, on the first page of Google result, uh, results, you'll find three references to the Warwick MA and the largest number, four of the top 10 results, are references to this conference itself. Uh, you may well not have realized it then, and from my conversation with him on the subject, I don't think James himself realized it, but another way of looking at this is that, excitingly, our conference marks the birth of a new discipline called Literary Translation Studies, and we are all its midwives. Now, if that's the case, then it's important that we take stock. How has this situation come about, especially without our realizing it? Historical linguistics teaches us that new words and phrases are coined to fill gaps in a semantic field when they arise. So we're forced to conclude that there hasn't been a perceived need for the phrase literary translation studies so far. And I want to suggest that there hasn't been a perceived need because historically until the 20th century, translation studies effectively was synonymous with literary translation studies. If we delve back into the beginnings of translation theory in the West, we find classical authors reflecting on the translation of the finest works of Greek literature and Christian scripture into Latin. And that prejudice in favor of prestige literature remained at the heart of translation theory for 2000 years. In the modern era, it's particularly evident in theorists of the German school, uh, when that great translator of the complete works of Plato, Friedrich Schleiermacher, opens his 1813 lecture on the different methods of translating, for example, by distinguishing between the interpreter and the translator proper, and dismissing the former in a thoroughly elitist fashion. The interpreter, we're told, plies his trade in the area of business, while the translator proper works above all in the areas of science and art. When Walter Benjamin writes in 1923 of the task of the translator, again, the bias in favor of the translator of high literature is clearly in evidence, unsurprisingly from a translator of Baudelaire and Proust. Uh, 
Uh, not least when he holds up as his exemplar of translation, that beloved example of the German school for the last 200 years, Hölderlin's translations of Sophocles. In our own time, the translation theorist who's been perhaps most inspired by the work of Schleiermacher and the German romantics is Lawrence Venuti. Here again, the translator whose invisibility is the focus of Venuti's seminal 1995 work, the, the translator's invisibility, is a literary translator. The hermeneutic translation that he's championed in his more recent work uh, is predominantly a literary translation, and his hugely influential textbook, the translation studies reader um, is so heavily skewed towards the literary that it might as well have been titled the literary translation studies reader. So much of translation studies has been literary translation studies avant la lettre then. And indeed, we can play a parlor game of adding literary to the titles of seminal works in the history of translation studies, such as George Steiner's After Babel, Aspects of Language and Literary Translation, or indeed Susan Bassnett's Literary Translation Studies. Bassnett's work is a good illustration of the literary inflection of the discipline of translation studies when it was born institutionally in the 1970s out of comparative literature. But it seems to me that one way of reading the history of the development of translation studies in the 20th and now 21st centuries is to view it as a gradual evolution away from indeed backlash against these often assumed unspoken literary roots. That reaction can be traced back to the linguistics derived translation theory of Jakobsen and others in mid century, seeking to reorientate translation theory and establish it on a more scientific basis, putting behind them the centuries of more impressionistic literary translation theory that had gone before. Jakobsen indeed, moves so far away from literature in his definition of what translation is, that he's obliged to conclude his seminal 1959 paper on linguistic aspects of translation by conceding that, quote, poetry by definition is untranslatable, uh, to which many literary minded readers would doubtless respond that in that case, you need to change your definition of what translation is. Um, but that's by the by, since, Jack, since Jakobsen in 1959, what I would call the move or perhaps even the turn away from literary translation studies has only accelerated. And to much of contemporary translation studies, literary translation is an irrelevance. In recent decades, translation studies has sought to unshackle itself from the constraints of the focus on the literary. And this has led to a burgeoning of new areas of specialism. I'm thinking of studies of audio, visual and multimedia translation, for example, or much of the work on ecological issues in translation, sociological issues, translation and conflict, cognitive approaches, translation process research, and computer assisted translation. Another way of looking at this is to argue that translation studies has thereby only been catching up with the professional situation on the ground which is and always was that in the grand scheme of things, translational literary translation is a niche activity and the literary translator is not a typical translator. Our perspective from within Petra E is of course skewed in this respect because for Petra E, the default concentration on the literary is second nature. But we can be under no illusions about the fact that literary translation has lost its primacy, both within translation studies and within the translation landscape more generally. To be brutally honest, I don't think any of the following home truths is controversial. One, the majority of translators are not literary translators and do not spend their time working on literary texts. Two, the majority of translator training programs are not training literary translators. And three, the majority of contributions to translation studies are not focused on literary translation. Uh, it's easy, I think, to demonstrate these points, which are, I think, interrelated. To illustrate the first, um, let me cite the Diploma in Translation Qualification awarded by the Chartered Institute of Linguists in the UK. 
Uh, the somewhat immodest, but nonetheless, I think, justified boast of the CIOL website is that, quote, the diploma in translation is the gold standard for anyone wanting a career as a freelance translator or to work as a translator for international corporations worldwide and meets the need for a high level professional translating qualification. The way the DIP trans works is that budding translators need to demonstrate their proficiency by producing three translations under timed conditions, one of a general text and two featuring different kinds of semi-specialized language. What is particularly sobering for the literary translator here is that literature numbers among six options under the latter category, technology, business, literature, science, social science, law. This puts literature firmly in its place, and that place is as one specialism among many, among a range of other textual varieties with which today's translators are more commonly working. My second home truth, the majority of translator training programs are not training literary translators, is borne out by a network like the European Masters in Translation, whose criteria for membership very much sideline the literary and promote instead the use of information technology, training translation students, for example, to post edit machine translated output and to use CAT tools. The EMT's 35 point competence framework makes not one reference to literary translation. As evidence of home truth number three, the majority of contributions to translation studies are not focused on literary translation, one need only consider the conference programs of major international translator organizations uh, like the European Society for Translation Studies or the International Association for Translation and Intercultural Studies. At the recent IARTIS conference in Barcelona, there were 20 thematic panels under the overall theme, the cultural ecology of translation. And the only one which thematized literary translation was panel 13, creative texts, technology and ecology, co-convened by a certain James Hadley. This is the context, the increasing sidelining of literary translation by mainstream translation studies, within which it seems to me that we might begin to move towards a literary translation studies. In other words, it's high time for a backlash against the backlash. Let's proudly claim the term literary translation studies and seek to do justice to its true potential. Now at the British Centre for Literary Translation in Norwich, my colleagues and I are increasingly attracted by the designation literary translation studies as a potential umbrella term to cover all that we want BCLT to represent. Uh, we recently updated BCLT's mission statement to include an explicit reference to it. The center aims to develop a program of research projects and publications in literary translation studies that will establish new theoretical and methodological approaches to literary translation. The premise for our program then is that what I've been outlining as a reaction against the unspoken literary bias in translation studies in recent years can help bring a lot of issues into focus and offers an exciting opportunity for conceptual renewal, but that that can only happen if we square up to a lot of questions that need to be answered adequately if literary translation studies is to have a raison d'être. So, here are some of the questions that have been exercising us within BCLT. What are the distinctive features of literary translation studies as against any other kind? Are its questions sufficiently distinct to warrant being classed as a subdiscipline? Has translation studies neglected the literary in recent years? In what ways can the rest of translation studies benefit from being informed by a literary translation studies perspective? A quotation from my colleague, uh, Ceci, uh, Ceci Rossi, in what ways can the discipline of literary translation studies further the inquiry and research of other disciplines, such as creative writing, close quote? What kinds of creativity might be involved in non-literary translation? How can literary translation studies help define the literary? How far do the concerns of literary translation extend beyond the boundaries of literary translation proper? How does literary translation studies relate to the study of comparative literature, world literature, global literature? 
How might the politics of literary translation differ from the politics of other kinds of translation? What specific contributions can literary translation make to questions of cultural memory and indigenous cultural political identity? In what ways is the situation of professional literary translators different from that of other kinds of translator? What does the Petra E framework tell us about the specific requirements for a pedagogy of literary translation compared to other translation practices? What kinds of theoretical insight can be derived from the literary translation workshop as a form of pedagogy and knowledge exchange? In what ways does literary translation as research differ from other kinds of translation as research? In what ways do publishers view translated literature as different from other kinds of literature and other kinds of translation? What is distinctive about the literary translation archive as against other literary archives? Is the rise of automated translation a threat or an opportunity for literary translators? To what extent is untranslatability a specifically literary question? What kinds of impact can the study of literary translation have outside the academy? Um, that's an awful lot of questions. Uh, and it's not yet a coordinated research program, but it does effectively constitute the research agenda that we're looking to address within BCLT for the foreseeable future. I don't have time this morning to go into detail on any of these points. And in fact, I'd like to conclude quite quickly now to allow time for your questions. Uh, let me finish though by exploring just a couple of areas in more detail. Firstly, from the perspective of Petra E, what might the Petra E framework incorporate that is distinctively literary to contribute to literary translation studies? Well, put this way, the question is almost nonsensical, I think, because the Petra E framework was conceived from the outset and from the bottom up to represent the specificity of literary translator training. Even if we're very aware that there are members of the network who don't have a dedicated literary translation program and who perhaps offer literary translation modules within a more general translation program. Nonetheless, I think we can still usefully map the Petra E competences against other competence sets, such as the EMT set that I mentioned already, or the PACTA competences, in order to home in on what makes the literary difference, we might say, what Venuti was calling in the 1990s, the literary remainder, what we might call in Derridean mode, the literary supplement. What is distinctively literary then, about the Petra E framework. A second question that I want to follow up here from the mass of questions I outlined earlier relates to creativity. You'll remember that uh, James's IATIS panel was titled Creative Texts, Technology and Ecology. And in so many ways, the USP of literary translation, or in that case, literary machine translation and computer assisted literary translation comes down to the question of creativity whether it be the creativity of the source text or the creativity of the translator's response to it. This seems to me to be a key area then where literary translation studies can lead the way in conceptualizing an issue that is actually of relevance to all kinds of translation. And if it can do that, then it will earn the respect rather than say the resentment of scholars working in the myriad other fields of translation studies today. One final point then on the usefulness of this line of inquiry. In seeking to establish a robust rationale for literary translation studies, we need to guard against going too far the other way, claiming too much of a specificity for the literary within translation studies, ring fencing it too aggressively and erecting a cordon sanitaire around literary translation out of ignorance. I'm thinking here specifically about machine translation and cat tools, which were claimed for far too long to be anathema to the literary translator. Computer assisted literary translation has been an important and impressive strand at this conference already, and is an example of the value of keeping literary translation studies interdisciplinary. 
Another is the kind of work that Michael Cronin has been doing with his overarching concern for eco-translation, which is of cardinal importance for literary translation, yes, but ultimately impacts or should impact all kinds of translation endeavor. In promoting literary translation studies then, let's offer a course correction to a discipline, translation studies, which has otherwise, it seems to me, largely turned away from the literary in pursuit of other agendas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duncan, for your uh, paper, which um, I think uh, by itself uh, would be um, uh, a conference. <laughs> uh, so probably the discussion here uh, should be uh, uh, more than 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so maybe um, we, we will be just overwhelmed with the topic. Uh, for me, for example, the biggest issue here is my own thinking about is it um, uh, what are the benefits of developing something uh, outside the, the overall philology? Uh, somehow I am maybe old school and I like everything to be together in order to, to have this overall picture of everything. But of course, I understand that going in some direction that is uh, more uh, directed to the, what, what we are doing, what we love and what we are. I don't know, um, but maybe it has also some other merits. Uh, so Rodika uh, has a um, question. Uh, how do more general theories of translation are relevant to literary translation as well? Uh, for example, German functionalism integrate with more specialized literary theory of translation. Um, thank you, uh, Radhika. Um, I think that's a really interesting question because I, I think um, what, what I'm suggesting then is that we kind of we have our antennae out for the, the, the specifically literary um, uh, uh, relevance of any uh, translation theory. Some are going to be more relevant than others. Clearly, some are going to be more specific to literary translation studies. I mean, within um, uh, functionalist uh, uh, theories, then clearly the literary uh, is a certain kind of function. Um, and of course, there's been uh, outside of translation studies, there's been much theorizing within literary theory around what exactly the nature of the literary is. So it seems to me that that's something which literary translation studies can really contribute to. In other words, outside of the discipline of translation studies, uh, contribute to um, attempts to define the literary um, by looking at how uh, literary texts get translated. So that seems to me, you know, a dialogue with, in that case, uh, literary theory, um, which um, is potentially very productive and becomes more so if one focuses on the specifically literary aspects of a, of a translation theory. Um, so there we go. Yes, I mean, I think it's a it's a spectrum here. What I don't want to suggest is that on the one hand there's literary translation studies, and on the other there's there's everything else. That's why I wanted to conclude by saying, well, even though I'm suggesting we kind of push back a bit against what seems to me to be a trend away from literary translation studies in, shall we say, recent decades. Um, nonetheless, I don't want to set up what I was calling a sort of cordon sanitaire around literary translation. I don't want to, to, to um, suggest that uh, literary translation studies can't um, benefit from and contribute to interdisciplinary um, work in the, the, as in the examples that I gave. Yes, for, for us, for example, in Croatia, I don't know how that is in other countries. The problem with uh, studies of any translation is that uh, the system, the government system of professions does not recognize uh, translators as profession uh, per se. So we have, for example, teacher of languages or uh, something like that, but we don't have that and that's for us in Zadar was a problem 
because we wanted to uh, open the, the, this study, but uh, we, we didn't want to put something on diploma of our students that is not recognized by the government. And um, <laughs> that's the problem. Uh, Barbara think, is, is mm -hmm, sorry, 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 I will, I will read I Barbara's question. To that, Rafaela, because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it seems to me that's an area where the Petri e project, the Petri e framework can make a, a, a significant contribution because what one of the main things the framework is doing is precisely looking to uh, uh, kind of cash out the competences of literary translators in order to contribute to the increasing professionalization of of the discipline. Uh, and if that means that, say, the Croatian government will look again at, at literary translation and think, oh, well, hold on a minute, it's not just um, uh, technical translation, which we can recognize as having merit as a, as a profession, um, then all the better. Yes, uh, Barbara has a question for you and Una. So I will read these questions. Um, do you feel that literary translation studies and literary translation study needs to include uh, the voices and work of literary translators working beyond the academy? Uh, their paratext is diaries and writings being as valid as text produced in academic context. Uh, Duncan, you see probably questions, but I have to I read can, them. Yes, I'm just, I'm, I'm just catching up with, uh, with with Barbara's question. Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, I think this is this is an area where um, you know the academy. This is again one of the real virtues of Petra E for me is the way in which the academy and uh, other literary uh, translator training organisations have been in in dialogue uh, with each other, and not just organisations, but uh, individual uh, literary uh, translators as well. I mean, I think what's what's often the problem for literary translators is that the kind of theory that they are presented with, the kind of um, literary translation studies uh, that they are presented with, perhaps in, in the classroom as part of an MA uh, program or in another context, is too generic. It's not specifically uh, focused enough on literary translation so that it seems, you know, I think that is a major contrib contributor to the sense among practicing translators that maybe, oh, literary the uh, translation theory is too kind of abstract and too highfalutin. Um, uh, and the, 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 I noticed that Una's uh, question as well about uh, whether this is primarily a feature of English language translation studies. Again, I think that's a really good question. I was confining, for example, my Google searches to um, uh, English language um, literary translation studies, that phrase. Um, of course, you know, there are um, uh, potentially a variety of ways of describing the activity in other uh, languages. But again, one of the lessons of Petra E for me has been just the, the kind of different speeds perhaps in which literary translation is moving in different, well, different parts of Europe and potentially different parts of the world. Um, so this may well be an area which is more specific to um, the English speaking world. Um, I'm always uh, hesitant about making that move though. It's a bit like when the backlash against uh, Venuti's attempt to talk about invisibility as only really of relevance within the English speaking um, uh, world. And he got quite a lot of flack, I think, uh, for, for that argument. Argument. Um, I wouldn't want to propose that, but I think that there, there, in some areas there's certainly evidence that the English language uh, translation studies world is, uh, is different. Well, thank you very much, Duncan. This is all the time you have. Uh, for, for further discussion, you have chat, so you can continue that in chat or, or later on via mail and things. So thank you very much for your uh, amazing um, uh, uh, paper and uh, we have to think about in what way our studies will develop and because lit the studies of uh, uh, translation, uh, literature translation for me is a way to ex expand mind of, um, of a philologist. So, and, and this is the reason why I, I really, uh, I really read for the, for the question. So, Thank you, Duncan. One Thank more time. You. Thank you, everyone. Yes.